almost 2017. I know it's been a long time since a lot last podcast, and I know I've said before I'll try to keep this up and do it as frequent as possible, but things come up. You get new jobs. We have hurricanes down here in Florida. Oh, my goodness. But this interview I did with Bashal Gaiawali. Gaiawali? I don't know if I pronounced that right. I just called him Bashal. He called me Andrew. We're on a first name basis here. Anyways, we did this interview about a month ago, and if you have not heard of him yet, then it's either clear you don't follow me on Twitter, or you're not following any cancer news. Bashal runs a blog on eCancer.org, and I will post a link to that. But this is a no BS blog, cutting straight to the facts. This is a oncologist that is questioning medicine. During this interview, we talk about two things. First is olanzapine. First is olanzapine for anti-emetic therapy during chemo treatment. And then the next is discussing when should we not give drugs? What's the magical number on when to pull back the drugs? It's, uh, it's all a good interview. I left most of it in there. You'll have to forgive some of the sound quality. I didn't have all my recording equipment with me. I was recording on an old mic on my parents' kitchen table. I was taking a little vacation, and it just so happened that was a time when he was available. That's when I was available. He's in Japan. I'm obviously down here in St. Petersburg, Florida. It wasn't the easiest collaboration, but he was able to work with me to pull it off, and I think you will enjoy. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, if you want access to any of the articles... As always, please let us know, questioningmedicine at gmail.com, or look us out on Twitter. And if you have anyone, any patient at any time, either in the past or in the future, that you think might get cancer, which means probably everyone, then you need to put the eCancer.org blog of his in your favorites and check it at least once a month because there's just too much good information there. Today's intro song, well, I asked him, I said, what is a good cancer song? What is a good cancer song? And he said, well, a lot of my patients that survive or beat cancer tend to really... So here's the deal. We're going to talk about two things today, and I think these two things are close to my heart, and I think close to all providers' hearts. And we're going to start off here with chemo-induced nausea. And I know that we're just going to start off with a topic. And if you look at some of the guidelines, currently recommend drugs that cost somewhere around $500, but you maybe have different options today. So let's, if we can, start off with some basics. Roughly what percentage of patients get chemo-induced nausea? Uh, Thank you very much. This is a very, very important question because uh, chemo-induced nausea and vomiting, we call it CIMD. Uh, yeah, as you say, some drugs can cost more than $500, and that's for a single drug. If you, if you talk about the regimen of uh, anti-emetic therapy, then they can exceed $1,000 for one cycle of chemo. So it's a tremendous amount of money uh, because uh, we need to use these drugs for every cycle of chemo. It's not a one-time uh, treatment. All right, two important things. One, CINV. It's chemo-induced nausea and vomiting. It's going to come up again, so it's important that you remember that. And when I said $500, that's the one-time dose cost. So often we hear about these high costs of cancer treatments, but rarely do we hear about the high cost of the antiemetics that go along with the cancer treatments. Now, I hope you're sitting down for the knowledge bomb that is about to be dropped on us in about 10 seconds. Antiemetics cost a lot. And sometimes, uh, I think you'll be amazed to know that sometimes the cost of anti prevention is more than the cost of the chemotherapy. <laughs> yes. yes and, uh, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, it's amazing in, the, in a negative sense. The cost of anti prevention is more than the cost of the chemo for which it is prescribed. Boom. Boom, 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 boom. Multiple bombs, but all one big knowledge bomb. Did you catch that? We can't uh, generalize uh, generalize the chemotherapies altogether. Um, So 
it depends on the risk similar regimen we have been used. So depending on the risk of nausea, we have the four classes of chemo. One is called highly emetic chemo, or PET. And then we have moderately emetogenic chemo, it's called MET. And then we have low emetogenic and minimal emetogenic. So the highly emetogenic chemo, uh, in, in case of highly emetogenic chemo, nearly 90% or more than 90% of patients, they get uh, nausea and vomiting if we do not prescribe any anti-emetic prevention therapy. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Stop right there. Highly emetogenic chemo, moderate and low and minimal. But in the highly emetogenic chemo, or HEC, almost 90% of patients that don't get anti-nausea medication get chemo-induced nausea and vomiting, CINV. That is a number needed to harm about as close to one as I think I've ever seen. But uh, in case of moderately emetogenic regimen, around 30 to 90 percent of patients will get nausea and vomiting. If you want to describe the prophylaxis therapy, and in case of low emetogenic, around 10 to 30 percent of patients will get nausea and vomiting, and minimal emetogenic, less than 10 percent of patients get nausea and vomiting. So it depends on which drug we have been using. You're prescribing the anti-emetic therapy. Does it pretty much, for most people, do they only require one drug as for one uh, anti-emetic treatment? Uh, no. In fact, uh, depending on which, uh, well, depending on highly emetogenic or moderately emetogenic or low emetogenic uh, potential of the chemotherapy, we have different regimens of anti-emetic prophylaxis. So the most commonly used anti-emetic prophylaxis in case of highly emetogenic chemotherapy is uses three drugs, and out of those three drugs, two of them, they cost around 500 US dollars. <laughs> and we need to keep one thing in mind, that the cost is more in US than in other countries. So the cost that I have been saying is usually the cost of, you know, usually the cost of anti-emetic treatment in US. The same drugs, they cost lower in other, other parts of the world. They cost more in the US than they do anywhere else? Yes, yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next up is a game changer for me, but one I have yet to use because I actually just recently learned about it, but it's one I can't wait to use, and I actually learned it from Twitter, from the man, the myth himself, and that is the use of olanzapine for CINV. Olanzapine is a wonderful anti drug. Olanzapine has not been so much used in oncology as, a, as an anti emetic Olanzapine is, uh, as we all know, it's an antipsychotic. It's an atypical antipsychotic. And it has been used in psychiatry since a long, long time. But recently, we have also come to know about the anti emetic efficacy, anti emetic potential of Olanzapine. And it has been tried in a number of trials in chemo induced nausea and vomiting. And uh, you will be surprised to know that the Best study, the most, you know, the best data for for olanzapine treatment as anti-emetic prophylaxis in CINV comes from the study that is comparing OPD. We call it OPD. That's olanzapine plus talonosetron plus dexamethasone. OPD regimen is APD, and APD means apriptan, talonosetron, and dexamethasone. So in this study, OPD did better than APD regimen in that it is numerically better in all the parameters and statistically better in two or three parameters. And why is this study important? Because it is OPD versus APD. O is olanzapine, A is apricotent. Apricotent costs nearly $600. A set of apricotent. But olanzapine, it costs around $30. So it's a huge, huge Benefits. All right, quick recap just to catch up APD, OPD. We're trading out a $600 drug for a lanzapine, a six cent drug, or you know, much cheaper. So, triple anti emetic therapy, but one is way less. And a lanzapine taking names, kicking butt, if not better than the more expensive. And yeah, we have. The study which says OPD is numerically better than OPD in all the efficacy parameters and statistically better uh, 
not seen. But still, the OPD treatment regime, it has been ignored in oncology practice. Most of the institutions, most of the countries, they don't use this, and they have been using the APD, the expensive regime. So I find it very surprising that despite having a safety trial that says OPD is better than APD, we have ignored that study, we have ignored all antacids, and we have been prescribing this expensive regime. Why do you, I mean, this is, we obviously don't have evidence in this next part, but why do you think that it's been ignored? Is it just lack of knowledge of it being out there, or is it, uh, what do you think? I think there are a couple of issues. One is, of course, lack of knowledge, and another is people are not, like, oncologists, as oncologists, we are not comfortable with prescribing all and graphing it is an antipsychotic, and it has a level of being, of having some different type of toxicity than what we have been commonly seeing. And uh, one more thing is, one, one important criticism of this history is that uh, it, is not, uh, uh, it was not a blinded trial. It was an open, open uh, history, and uh, it was a single institution study. But I don't think this history can just be tossed aside saying it's not blinded or it's just a single institution. Because, you know, vomiting, it, it is not affected by blind. Like, people either vomit or they don't vomit. So, <laughs> good point. Yeah. Vomiting is a parameter that is not affected by blinding, number one. And uh, number two, in most of the chemical studies of CIMB, we have seen that it is easy to control vomiting, but it's very difficult to control nausea. And in this study, we have seen that OPD performs statistically better than APD in terms of nausea. So, Olandapin, I think, is a wonderful drug, but someone says it's, it's uh, an open level trial, someone says, the trial does not mention whether it's superior to trial or inferior to trial. Uh, so, by means of such excuses, people have been avoiding using this drug. But, but one important thing is the NCCM guideline, which is one of the most widely used guidelines throughout the world. The NCCM guidelines does include a the regimen as one of its recommended regimen. What about, and you kind of touched on it here, what about those out there who are listening to this right now and they're saying, wait a second, uh, the lanthine, I know that that's connected to uh, decreased seizure threshold, diabetes, prolongation of the TGC. Um, you know, it's rare, but neuroleptic malignant syndrome. I mean, come on, this sounds a little bit too dangerous for me to prescribe. What about those comments, why they do not want to use it? Yes, that is one of the, one of the very important reasons why people are not uh, using olanzapine as much as they should have. But, uh, you know, one, uh, what you're saying is all, uh, all correct. Uh, all and has a lot of side effects, and uh, it has a tendency to distribute to seizure and diabetes. But the good news is, this is, this data, they have come from, it's used as an antipsychotic. And as an antipsychotic, we prescribe it for a long, long time, and then patients develop the symptoms. But these trials of uh, chemo in this nausea and vomiting, in these trials, there has been no report of such, such adverse effects. Yep, there you have it. No report of such side effects. So if the side effects is what's holding you back, let it hold you back no longer, my friend. Because in these trials, for human induced nausea and vomiting, we use oranzapin only for four days. So 10 milligrams per day for four days. So at this dose, at this short course, oranzapin has, uh, until now, in trials, oranzapin has not shown any such uh, side effects of uh, seizure precipitation or uh, neuroleptic malignant uh, syndrome, uh, such side effects. But one side effect that is seen is hypoglycemia, uh, uh, sedation, and uh, weight gain. Weight gain. One of the main side effects. Ooh. So it's probably okay for the men, but you know the women are going to complain about that one. But I think uh, weight gain is uh, a good effect for cancer patients. So I think it's a, it's a good thing. Um, but regarding sedation, there was a very, in fact, one very recent study on all that which published in the New England Journal just four days ago. And for those of you playing along at home, the study he's about to reference is olanzapine for prevention of chemo-induced nausea and vomiting. This was in New England Journal of Medicine, July 14, 2016. And in this study, we can see that olanzapine has not much change in sedation overall, but there is a significant increase in sedation with olanzapin only on day two, and on day three, day four, day five, it's the same as placebo. So there is 
some some ingredients today some and they too and we should be careful about it like to inform our patients not to not to dry but except that until now uh, in the trials we have not seen any significant side effect of all right what about those people who say listen i don't remember the exact mechanism i don't remember uh, you know if it's metabolized with CYP 1A to B 1A 2. I don't remember. All I remember is back in med school, they said, listen, this drug interacts with all these other drugs, and if you can avoid it, avoid it. Yes, that's a very important point. Uh, in fact, all I'm does have interactions with, with some drugs, and some of these interactions can be significant. But having said that, uh, we, are, we are discussing about all I'm talking versus Atropitin is very expensive, all and is cheap. And now, while talking about drug interaction, we need to remember that Atropitin has more interaction than all and All and has interaction, but Atropitin is more notorious for, for having interactions with, with many drugs. You convinced me I'm actually excited to try it next time I'm given the opportunity, but here's the, the game-changing moment. Time to put your money where your mouth is. Do you use it in practice? Ah, this is a very difficult question to answer because in Japan, all of that thing has not been approved by the insurance, by the National Health Insurance for use as an anti mutant for tumor in this nausea and vomiting. So in Japan, we cannot use it. That's why we have been raising our voices and there have been some trials and hopefully after the publication of this trial in New England Journal of Medicine, hopefully all and that will be approved as an anti mutant for CIMB prevention. But having said that, uh, I have my colleagues in Nepal. Uh, it's a low income country. And in case of low income country, all and that is much more important because it's cheap and it can provide near the same species. And in Nepal, we have been using all and that and there has been no problem and uh, it has been giving very good results. And uh, patients who are taking chemo and who otherwise have very hard time due to nausea and vomit, so all and that is a great drug, especially for low income countries or low income savings, even in the US for patients who can't who have insurance problems and who can't uh, afford uh, expensive drugs. I think all and is a, is a great alternative. You have you sold me on that one. Is there anything else that you want to mention before we move to the next topic? Yes, uh, in fact, uh, as I have been telling you, there is one study that is published in New England just four or five days ago, and in this study, they have in fact compared. Uh, APD with APD plus all and that. So now they have been comparing four drug regimen with three drug regimen. So I think uh, this 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 study might uh, lead to approval of all and as an anti in many countries. But my my personal experience and opinion, looking at the data of this study, is that even in the placebo group, even in the APD group, there is not good data for control of nausea and vomiting. So I think. Uh, if Poland I think this gets approved in, in other countries, I think we need to first try the OPD regimen, the two drug regimen, and if there is no good control, then then we can move to four drug regimen. That makes sense, I think, to me, is to you know not just jump straight to four, but use three first, and it makes total sense. I love that. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, next topic. This one is something I think it's near and dear to my heart because. This is something I think that we all struggle with a little bit, at least for myself. The quality of life in cancer patients or those who have cancer and the quality of their life near the end of their life. And specifically, the American Society of Clinical Oncology recommends against the use of chemotherapy in solid tumor patients who have not benefited from prior treatment and who have an Eastern Cooperative Oncology group score, uh, performance status score of three or more. So let's start with an easy one. And I think, I think I know the answer, but you're the expert. I got to ask you, but why not just chemo everyone, no matter what, no matter how severe the disease? Yeah, that's a great question, Andrea. Right, exactly. Why not chemo everyone? Many, uh, many of us think, uh, many of us have the same question. Uh, so, but, you know, the problem is, what is our objective? in giving chemo to our patients. So what is our goal? In the adjuvant setting, of course, the, the goal is cure. But in the metastatic setting, cure is not the goal. The goal is to help our patients live longer and live better or live better. So we try, 
So we provide chemo to both patients who can realize these goals. Otherwise, there is no point in delivering this toxic therapy. So for patients uh, who are towards the end of life, chemo drugs the reverse. It decreases the quality of life and it can sometimes kill sooner due to the toxicities of the chemo. So you do not want to spend thousands of dollars to make someone die sooner, so, so there is no point. Now, do we have evidence that suggests patients do better if not treated towards the end of their life? Yeah, this is again, again a very important question. And this question has even bugged me sometimes. And, you know, like we have long acknowledged that uh, for patients towards the end of their life, the most important thing is the quality of life. So we have even recently started to talk about quality of death. So, you know, cancer treatment is an aggressive care, aggressive medicine. These drugs are very toxic and they, they take away every little stamina that's left in your body. So even in the control setting of clinical trials, many patients do suffer serious adverse events with very little benefit. So, I mean, what's the point in torturing the patients towards the end of life with these treatments? It doesn't mean that these patients should not be treated at all. They should be treated for the symptoms, such as pain, anxiety, constipation, delirium. But, but uh, there is no point in treating them for their for, for, for the cancer with, with chemotherapy. The goal is to help uh, to make, make their life their transition journey as smooth, peaceful, and comfortable as possible. Yeah. Uh, you know, there are, there are studies, including one. Nearly 70% of young patients are receiving aggressive care for the last 30 days of their life. So when, when patients are young, we get more aggressive, we tend to be more optimistic. Uh, but uh, I think we need to learn how to truly allow someone to rest in peace before they actually die. And I think uh, the patients deserve that. As you said, and I said, I think it's something that all of us struggle with a little bit is and this is my next question. I know in a lot of the trials, it talks about with an estimated six months of life to live. And here's what I've never known. Hopefully, you can make this clear to me, at least, if not anyone who's listening, is how in the world do we estimate six months of life to live? Where does that come from? <laughs> <laughs> That's an amazing question. And, and uh, to be very honest, even I do not know how is that, uh, <laughs> that estimated. Uh, you know, in fact, this is just guesswork. Uh, guesswork uh, based on experience or experience. In most of the trials that uh, you mentioned, they, uh, the, the, if, you, if you look at the trials in methodology, then uh, they mentioned that a physician estimated life expectancy of six months or less. So it's a physician estimated life expectancy. But you know, the interesting thing is, we have a, we have, we have a number of studies which show that Physicians are very bad at predicting prognosis. There are so many studies that say physicians are overly optimistic in making predictions of prognosis. And I think this is one reason and explain why we tend to provide chemo to those patients who are about to die, because we are very optimistic in making the predictions of prognosis. But uh, nevertheless, in making prognosis, there are some tools, such as the prognostic index, and there are, there are some other, other tools that are more accurate at predicting prognosis compared with uh, just the guesswork. But, but most of us, we do not use that in our daily clinical practice. They have been seldom used in, in clinical research as of yet. Most of those estimations that we have been providing is just based on the data from clinical trials. You brought up an excellent point there, and that it's the physician estimated six months. And let's say you're seeing someone that you've seen for a while, and you're looking at them, and you're thinking, man, six, you don't have six months left. It's time that we maybe we stop this. But when you talk to them in the office, their oncologist is saying, listen, let's be aggressive. Something I've always struggled with, and this is why I'm asking you, I know there's no evidence on this, is what is the best way about going out to reaching out to the oncologist and saying, is this still worth it at this point? Yes, you know, like hardest job is to communicate with the patient. It's always easy to prescribe drugs. It's always easy to, to recommend something. But it's very difficult to sit with the patient and do the hard talk. You know, uh, we have been talking about the safe decision-making process in which uh, the patient plays an important role in, in deciding his treatment plan. So good treatment plan for the, for the cancer patient. Uh, but the most important thing to realize is that 
is the patient's voice that should be given the first trial. And the patient should fully understand the benefits and harms of the treatment. So, you know, as, a, as an oncologist, as a, as a doctor, we always feel that it's our responsibility to, to do something for the patient. So, if, if we can't do something, if we say, like, okay, there, there, is, there is nothing to be done, then we feel like we are, we are, we are incapable of helping, helping the patient. That's, that's one of the reasons why most of us tend to prescribe chemotherapies or other drugs, even though we know that they are not going to benefit. But I think the most important thing to, to accept and to realize is not prescribing is the best thing that we can do for the patient. Did he just say what I think that he said? An oncologist? He did not just say that. Not prescribing is the best thing that we can do for the patient. Yep, he said it. Uh, you know, there is a saying that a good surgeon knows when to cut, but a great surgeon knows when not to cut. So even in even in, yeah. yeah exactly. So even in oncology, a a great a good oncologist prescribes chemo. A great oncologist knows when not to prescribe chemo. That might be the line of the podcast right there. That was well said. Here is for me my last question for you: is those that I see that are diagnosed very late in the game. Uh, maybe they don't have health insurance. Maybe they just didn't. Who knows what it may be. By the time you finally get to them, there's nets in a thousand different locations. If they're not doing well, is it still worth it in those patients to at least start chemo and see if you can keep it from progressing? Or does it depend on what the primary uh, cancer is? Or I guess what I'm really asking is, is there ever a point in which you say, wow, this is so late in the game. This has progressed so far. It's really limited any drugs that I have that I can offer you because they the drugs maybe just weren't studied in this type of patient. You know, the number of myths as such, they don't matter for treatment decisions. Uh, because, you know, lately we have some, some wonderful targeted drugs that can show very good response, even for patients that have lots of lots of meds. But with increasing number of meds, the patients performance status, the patient's physical ability, it worsens. And the usual rule of the thumb is not to prescribe chemo when patients PS, we call performance status, when it is more than two. So that is uh, more than two means a patient who is confined to bed or chair for more than 50% of time he or, uh, he or she is away. So for those patients, we, we the, the, the usual rule is not to prescribe chemo. So uh, you know, most of the clinical trials uh, also exclude these patients because the benefit, and uh, therefore the benefit uh, is not known for these patients. However, even even PS has its own circumstances because we said uh, a PS of more than two means a patient who is confined to bed for more than 50% of the time is awake. But for patients with paralysis or amputations, this doesn't work. But as a tool, it is still very useful. And uh, thinking is not to prescribe chemo for a patient uh, of PS more than two or three, as we as we discussed earlier, if the estimated if the estimated life expectancy is less than six months, then there is no uh, there is more harm than good in prescribing chemo. I have learned so much not only today in this podcast. I've learned so much following you on Twitter. I've learned so much following your blogs. You are doing great things on this last subject here: um, end of life uh, chemo towards the end of life. Anything that you want to say? There is not much, but uh, uh, I think I'd like to I'd like to say one final thing that uh, we we as doctors we owe it to our patients and to ourselves to know what we are doing and whether we are doing the right thing and to acknowledge the doubt when we have one. So I think uh, we owe it to our patients and to ourselves. So whenever we are we are doing something for the patients, we need to be sure what we are doing is the right thing. So the, the, the first Hippocratic uh, principle, first do no harm. I think that is a very important thing in cancer as, as, as it is in other, other fields. You have taken the words right out of my mouth. I really appreciate you coming on today. Uh, it has been such a pleasure. You know, thank you so much for, for giving me this chance to talk with, uh, uh, talk with you and, and thereby connect with so many people uh, and share, share some of my views.